Hold on one second. Okay, I think we're live now. All right, are we on? Uh, yep, here we are, live on Facebook. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us this uh, Sunday afternoon, long weekend. Um, I'm Robin Peckham. I'm one of the co-directors, along with Magnus Winfrew of uh, Taipei Dangdai. Uh, this past week, we just launched uh, Taipei Connections, uh, which is an online initiative that we built in, in conjunction with Ocula uh, as an attempt to help um, the Taipei's art world connect with the global art world. And in a time of social distancing and travel restrictions, we hope that we can still uh, share some of the incredible exhibitions that we have happening uh, in Taipei right now. And we're gonna see one of those today. And we also have the pleasure of a couple studio visits, uh, both in China and in Taipei. And so I hope everyone uh, enjoys that. Uh, a note on language, uh, most of our panels today are bilingual. We have elements in Chinese and English. Uh, so if you aren't hearing what you wanna be hearing, just stick around for a few minutes and we'll make sure uh, something is shared. Um, you can feel free to use the Q&A function on Zoom or to use the commenting function on Facebook and we'll make sure the questions get to the panelists in a timely fashion. 首先要说的是语言的问题我们今天主要都是双语中文有英文如果您是听不到您想听的语言 我们首先是要欢迎黄雅纪 在台北或者在世界各地分享我们各自的展览，那我们这次也很荣幸，因为刚好我们这个时候是关渡美术馆邀请了我们的艺术家赵刚在在台北做一次他的第一个美术馆的展。那我想上主理谈谈赵刚是
the experiences they had during the problematic and troubling times of the Cultural Revolution. As a young man, he was part of the STARS group, China's first modern art movement. In 1983, Zhao Gong left China to study in Europe and eventually relocated uh, in New York City, where he continued his education and his practice. In New York City, he made a home for himself where he worked and lived for nearly two decades and formed what was called a community of the Chinese avant-garde in New York City at that time. For some time, he practiced and created works in America and became, you know, from, he went from Zhao Gong, the citizen of China, to an American citizen.其实是赵刚他自己在去年的时候做了一个假的回顾展其实他本身就是一直不断的从中国跟自己本身的历史的交错然后就用一些自己本身的幽默的方法以及或者是一种感伤的方法去做一个对话所以在这些小的里面包括
。那其实事实上，他画的是一个被切半到一半的佛像。那是，嗯，我个人认为，在他把一个象征中国非常，或者是不,不只是中国自己，就是对从西方来讲，也非常认为是一个中国代表的佛教佛像，做一个切割，看不到头，看不到手。然后在一个呃，可能是明代或者是其他时代的一个桌子上，那这些东西都把我们对于一般中国的形象做了一个切割。那后面留下的是一大片很大的留白。那事实上，我认为这些作品呢，其实就象征的他自己对于这段时间呃世界关系，或者是大家对于中国认同的一个空虚的所在。那当然我，我呃，另外还有一点就是，赵刚最近真的是因为心境的改变，他画了也画了许多的关于静物，就是不管是他的佛像，或者是他最近也生产了一批新的呃小的油画。那这个油画呢，其实都是他自己日常生活中里面所使用的香烟呐、啊，或者自己的一些桌子椅子。那我去看跟他聊天的时候，他就说，其实这套油画正是从我们之前在呃刚刚。看到的那一批水彩，也就是之前在我们画廊展的这个他自己的一个假的回顾展里面所展现的作品，再继续研发出来的，就是他在把他自己跟这个历史之间的交融做的，我觉得做的更具个人化、更完整一些。Yeah, to piggyback on what Yaji was saying and to explain a little bit, a little bit in English, so this. Work that we see here is a still life of a Buddha, which is, of course, a very important symbol within Chinese culture. But the head and the hand of the Buddha have been cut off,、um, and of course, the background of this still life is left blank it's, or left white.、Um, this is a sense of negative space, this sense of uneasiness, and also the sense of emptiness, perhaps. Today's、uh, live stream is on the topic of pathos, and I think that this is a work that demonstrates. Zhao Gang's inner feeling at that time, living in quarantine, unable to leave, unable to, you know, unable to enjoy and the play that is part of his life, everyday life. And I think this is something that everyone,、uh, to some extent, has experienced, especially right now. To transition over to a, to a different painting over here, this is Coronavirus One, one of my favorites from the series. And I think also one that expresses the idea of pathos quite well. We have here what appears to be a plum tree with black leaves and red plum fruits. Interestingly enough, I think the plum tree in the U.S. is commonly referred to as a thundercloud,、um, something sort of ominous, something、uh, looming ahead and foreboding about this black、uh, foliage that sits in the center of this. Primarily white piece. Later on, we'll see some more colorful, colorful works and more playful works by Zhao. But this work is nearly monochrome. There's almost an absence of color. We have a window pane cut in half by the center of the window. Behind it sit、uh, cascading layers of snow or white rooftops that are absolutely barren. Something that connotates death or Uh, danger in the outside world behind that glass, and even the foliage outside. You can see the trees are fruitless, without leaves, perhaps dead. 事实上，我也非常喜欢这件作品，因为它的那个感觉确实，因呃，第一个就是雪景是赵老师比较少表达的，第二个就是。确实跟我有的时候心情很沮丧，不管是到达北京或是离开北京的时候的那个景色，我觉得是非常的相近的。那最后呢，因为我想是不是时间也比较不是那么多，那我们最后想要带大带带大家看一下这一次展场里面比较特殊的几件作品。那一件是呃，大家看一定呃，目前至今来讲，大家看了反应都非常。震撼的一件，嗯、呃，湖北女人。那这件作品总共高有九米。那呃，可以特别跟美术馆特别为了这次的展览，从北京，呃，跟赵老师借展。那作品呢，非常的雄伟，会从在关渡美术馆一进入的时候就看到这件作品。
那赵刚化，呃，这个大陆女，好，我们说大陆女，其实是从二零一一年的时候就开始。那当时她在中国美术馆做的病夫的时候，那几间大楼真的是非常的震撼我。那在她后来的几次重要的展览里面，都会有一个大几的女性，呃，站在那边。那对赵老师的解释来讲，就是，呃，到底就是历史，或者是是，呃，是。真相是由谁决定的？那权力的象征到底是不是全部都是男性？他基本上也是一个女性主义者，但是他也经常用这样子很震撼的影像去做了不同的、呃、表现。另外的话，我们可以再走到其他的现场。So right here is another set of works that we have on a very different scale. This is 18, to, uh, to, the, to the left you'll see 18 portraits of China's first women. So different uh, women who were the first in their field. And over here we have a large scale work or a couple of them, Monkey King. Now,我想这次的展览其实是关注美术馆这个展览是由馆长这黄建宏先生特别策划的。那我自己其实今年这几年每一档从刘伦斯的个展一直到迈阿密、赵刚的个展，我们我都有亲自去亲临现场。那我
呃，今天有幸请呃老高从道上来给我们讲一讲这幅非常精神的作品，名字叫做《坏人》。那咱们来听他讲一讲这个画、啊、背后创作的思考。So, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Mr. Dao here with us, uh, to tell us about the thoughts behind the creative process of this astonishing painting named Bad Dog. So let's start with the very first question. Um, the first question that I would like to start off to lead this conversation is. Why are there large areas, as you can see on the painting, that remain largely uncolored? Uh,反正第一个问题是，这幅画不讲为什么要走这个方向？上次说是空白的部分，对。一般来说，一个画的创作流程通常是从大地开始，你所谓的留白。其实甚至是打底的部分，而其实真正没有被完成的是连打底都没有被打到的部分。呃，对我而言，创作从打底这个部分开始，我就很难不去意识到自己心里面一些微小的变化。Okay, so uh, what Mr. Dong just said is that.、Uh... Uh, coloring the canvas is very often the very first step of with which he starts off the entire painting process.、Um, however, very often when he starts covering, sorry, when he starts coloring the canvas, he feels certain changes in his consciousness,、uh, and at that point, he will often change the trajectory or, or sort of how he, how and where he takes the painting. Right. So、uh, it is the most subtle、uh, movements that sort of inform him, the artist, that he has felt this very, he has felt this very unusual creative spark.、Uh, sometimes it's, it's a twist of a brush that makes him feel like he has to take this painting into a new direction. This is when I will give up the original plan and simply act. 对我而言，这样的画面上看上去有很多不完整的不完整性。呃，如果最后的结果是好的，我会认为这些看起来像底板颜色未完成的部分，因为它的未完成反而更加的好，因为它保留了这个画板最原初的原始的状态。以及它后续陆续被完成的呃过程，你可以看到绘画过程的一个穿透，使得啊 ，OK， 呃、uh, ，so although at the first glance、um, part of the canvas seems the color process seems unfinished because there are、uh, you can almost see through and see the, the uncolored parts of the canvas, but to him、uh, not having the, the painting Uh, completed, uh, but to, for him to not have、uh, to not complete、uh, the painting in the traditional sense is actually the positive attribute for the painting, and the reason is that people viewers can actually see through the many layers of painting and to get a better glimpse of the painting process that he as an artist has had to go through. 对我而言，这些小的讯号，这些讯号像我们刚刚说的，这张画是在一次之内，一个火的瞬间被聚合以及完成的。那对我而言，这样的一个结果，远比执行人们的计划更重要。所以是为什么会有大量空白？对，呃 ，another reason to leave。Uh, many parts of the canvas uncolored to leave many brushstrokes unfinished is that this gives the viewer, as well as him, the artist, a sense that the painting was、uh, finished when all the brushstrokes are at the most lively stage. 
so this to him is the best stage of where to do. 因为画是在一个瞬间活着未完成，所以画家没有时间在里面做质感的填补。Okay, uh, in these words, the painting is mostly alive when he was uh, completed, but it stopped abruptly. So this also shows that uh, the artist followed his own consciousness and didn't really force his hand to sort of. Uh, make the painting more aesthetically pleasing in traditional sense. Um, what I would like to go from here is to, I think I have uh, several other questions. And the second question is, so um, I liked uh, Mr. Dao to talk about some of the very uh, colorful visual elements that we see on the canvas. Uh, uh,这幅画，如同前面讲的，虽然是说好像是自由的发挥，可是它其实一开始是有一个原始的图片，可能是一个网络上一只野狗的图片，可是虽然它最后的结果也完全没有没有没有没有像原来的那个呃原始的资
之前讲的弯曲，其实可以看到刚刚泡脚的这个不形成、不不错的比例，也就是这只股价在完成的时候，它完成前段的时候并没有意识到它的后升，而在这后升出现，而这后升也许是最前面这个蓝色，来自于最原始无意义的笔画的时候，决定了它前肢不够长。在后，在这个接下来的时候，就放弃了前一组绘画的语言，以一个喷漆的形式去延伸它的前肢，也把前一组绘画语言跟前一组绘画逻辑在这边做一个了断。而这我也是我觉得这个画里面特别精彩的一个决定。Now talking about the changes of the language of the painting, Mr. Zhang said when he started painting the two. Front legs of the dog, as you can tell, the pearls right here. Because the dog is trying to grab and catch a pigeon, a hooper right here. Um, he he had no idea that what the proportion of the back leg was going to be. And then, as we can see, later on, the back leg will be much longer. And what did he plan to uh, sort of connect it to this blue stroke as one of the back legs, as we said earlier? So, because the front legs ended up being much, much shorter than the back legs, which all of it he drew freehandedly, he decided to again uh, play with the language of the painting and adopt a spray paint uh, for the two front legs to extend it to a bit longer. Um, this sort of serves several purposes. It, it sort of extends the front legs to make it proportional. It also allows him to play uh, continually with different types. 最后这张画有一个右边有一个白色的，像布满一样的这个人形，里面有一个人形的特征的角色在右边出现，对它与之对应这边处理的一些黑色的元素。在最后，这些黑色分歧的部分，其实要把最后的一个点缀，包括它的前肢，刚刚讲到的头的前前肢的延伸，以及好像它都跟刚刚类似后面讲的，还是还是帽子一样的符号。被完成，最后把这个画的绘画语言做了一个跳跃。Right, so when we take a look at the two far edges of painting, we can see that、uh, again the language of the painting changes once more. Right, you can tell right here there's there's something there's a very abstract painting of a person with the face, the two eyes right here.、Uh, this is towards the end of the painting. Now, if you see the black semicircles towards the left edge of the painting. In fact, Mr. Da started off wanting to paint another person, but once again he let his consciousness take over, and、uh, he decided that、uh, he wasn't going to paint anything realistic. He decided to adopt more abstract techniques. So the semicircles and、uh, the omega sign, like sign right here at the top of the head, as well as the spring paint,、uh, this is sort of the end stage of painting. But this is also how he、uh, played with the technique and the language. Leave the painting as it is at a very lively stage. So、um, uh, I'd like to continue our conversation、uh, by asking the next question. I, I wonder、um, what he feels now that the painting is somewhat、uh, done at this stage. 那么导师，那么我想问一下，就是说，那这个画面它现在算是某种意义上的画，你现在的感觉是怎样？其实你说要完成与否，我倒都不是很确定。对我而言，呃，他真的完成了吗？对于我的两个角色而言，比方说，呃，一个创作在一个创作者在工作室而言，他是否真的完成与否，对我而言完全不重要。如果我今天是在学院里面做一个评估，我会问出类似的关于完整性的问题。是真正回到工作室，当我真的在工作的时候，这个画是否在完美的状态下被终结，对我而言是不需要去追究的一件事。OK， 呃、uh, ，That's quite an interesting answer. So what I asked him a second ago was how he feel now that the painting is done. And the first thing he said to me is, I'm not sure if the painting is done. Nor do I really care. This is not a problem. The process, he said,、um, if I'm, you know, working as, as a teacher, you know,、uh, commenting and remarking on the students painting, then I would care more about whether the painting has been traditional, in the traditional sense,、uh, completed, right? But when I am、uh, making,、uh, sort of engaged in my own creative process, that's not something that I pay 
prosecution. Thanks very much. I'm sorry to have to uh, stop you there. Uh, we need to uh, get on to the next group, but uh, that was a real pleasure. It's amazing to have this deep read of a single painting, uh, which I think is something that we generally don't get enough of. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, your time and analysis of that today. Thank you. All right, uh, now we're moving over to mainland China and Hong Kong. Uh, Claudia from Massimo Di Carlo. Uh, has invited uh, the artist Liu Song, uh, who's in a solo presentation in Taipei Connections with some really incredible uh, recent paintings, and the uh, eminent curator and critic uh, Karen Smith. Uh, when, when you guys come on, would you mind introducing where you are? I'm quite curious where everybody is at the moment. Uh, but uh, over to the three of you. I look forward to this. Claudia is muted, it looks like. Oh. Myself? Okay. Hi. Okay. I am Claudia Albertini. I'm the director of Massimo De Carlo in Hong Kong. And I am in Hong Kong. Uh, currently, uh, not every day I would be at the gallery, but uh, things in Hong Kong, of course, are getting a little bit better. Uh, but let's move to uh, Lusong and the reason why we are here. First of all, I'm very delighted that uh, we had the chance to participate to Taipei Connection, and even more delighted to be able to present uh, part of the new series of work, uh, Shadow Portraits, by uh, Chinese artist Lusong. I met Lu Song uh, three, maybe four years ago. At that time, he was uh, just about to exhibit at uh, the OCAT in Xi'an, an exhibition that uh, was curated by Karen Smith. And, uh, and I have to say that is uh, thanks to Karen, in fact, that I got to know uh, Lu Song and his work. And there's been uh, a fantastic uh, momentum uh, going from there up to now. Um, the works uh, of Luzon, for those that are not uh, um, very familiar with his painting, are uh, a, a journey through, through surreal, sometimes surreal, sometimes very likely to real landscape. They are uh, interspersed with uh, atmospheres, with emotions. And, uh, and they, uh, they describe, uh, I mean, I'm just giving like a very, brief intro, but uh, they, to me, they describe uh, a journey, um, personal journeys, emotional journeys, uh, to emotions that are interspersed also with uh, a very particular technique. Uh, I invited uh, Karen here today to uh, talk with Luzon about his work, so she is uh, not only a, a, a not curator, an art historian, and an art critic, she's also a dear friend to me. So I'm very thankful uh, for you to be here with us. And I'll pass it over to Karen, maybe? Okay. <laughs> okay, hello. Um, I'm extremely happy to be here. I will say a little bit in Wa 可以恢复工作 
呃丰富呃的这幅绘画，现在在台北 Connection， 你会发现了，好像是没有人。所以我就是想先请你谈一下，就是这系列是怎么变成一个系列，是从一个肖像变成二十张作品，而且是从一到差不多呃十六，就越来越丰富了，越来越。好像是透露进去你的你的这些符号、植物，可是没有人，所以我们怎么理解 portrait， 怎么理解理解 shadow？ 嗯，请你来给我们讲一下。好的，谢谢凯伦老师。呃，我首先先说一下，我们那个三个人，我们认识相识应该是二零一七年，就是。呃，马上在呃 O C G 的展览以后，我们就认识了，我就认识 Claudia。呃，凯伦当然是一个一个良师益友了，然后 Claudia 是我们的好朋友，然后我们做什么事都需要 Claudia。呃，那么现在就是这个这个这个 Shadow Portrait 呢，它这个应该不是一个呃呃可以就是语法正确的英文，它是由两部分组成，一个是呃 Shadow 和 Portrait。最早呢是源于二零一七年的一张画，就叫 Portrait。然后呢，他就我就就是一开始的想法就是，呃呃，这是我随手拍的，在路边拍的一个呃一个照片。然后上面有一个就是，呃，很看着貌似很脆弱呀这种，呃这么一个一株植物。然后我想呢，把它因为大大概也就这么高吧，四十到五十公分，我想把它画的。稍微再高大一些，所以说当时那张画是一米二九十的，然后后来到了今去年，然后我想，然后再再进一步去加深一下这个概念，就是虽然它是它叫 portrait， 它没有一个具体的形象在里边，它就没有一个具体的人物形象在里边，但是它给你的感觉，给我的感觉好像是，呃，非常的羞涩，而且又非常的倔强，这么一个奇特的这么静态趋势，因为它这个。有一个，你看这后边，这就是它有一个一个一个静态的一个这么一个非常稳定的趋势在里头，而且它这个光线，当光线打过来的时候，它有种像像伦勃朗式那种油画式的那种布光，是在像四十五度侧光这么打在这个植物上，所以说它，我觉得它非常符合，在从这一点来说是非常符合这个古典油画人物肖像的。所以说，我想把他这个，呃，这方面就比如说他的表情啊，他不是说在面部的表情，而是一种是，呃，遍布于呃这整个图像的某每一个角落的这么，都散射出来他的一个一个表情，就是呃主体上虽然不是非常的，呃，不是一股人物的有眼神啊或者什么可以凸显出他的这个呃神态啊他的神情表情，但是通过这个整个的背景来烘托出来他整个这个。这个这个这个气氛和这个表情，所以说最早是，嗯，一种抽象的表情吧，大概是。所以说从这个出发点呢，我完成了大概前三张是这样的。从二零一九年去年之后呢，我就把重心慢慢的移到这个就是这个阴影的部分，因为这个我觉得这个这个亮部啊，这个光线照射在这个就是这个。呃，叶子的这个表面形成的这种光区，这种呃三角形的区域呢，它是可以作为一种这个导向性的作用，呃，引来引导观者进入这张画面，而真正观者去呃在里边沉浸在里边一种获得一种体验的，是相反是它的阴影部分，呃，所以说这是我背后这个呢是呃是这是第五章，这是第六章，呃，我在第五章的时候就开始强化这个。这个这个粉红色的部分就是人人眼，呃，第一眼看到的部分，其实它是一种导向性作用，就是呃，我可以把自己投射在这儿。然后你如果看原画的话，就会发现这个这个背景我是做了下了很大功夫的。而这个粉色区域，包括这个黄色区域，它只是一个平色在里边，也非常简单处理。而这个阴影部分是非常复杂的一种，呃，层与层之间的关系啊，这种冷暖关系啊。黑白灰关系啊，还有点线面关系，非常丰富的这么一个呃背景，包括虚实关系。所以说，在后边的几张之后呢，呃，一直到十六张、十七张开始，十七、十八、十九、二十呢，是一种嗯呃局部，就是我我提取一个每呃一个一个，比如说阴阴影的局部吧，大概是有的时候上面，有的时候下面，呃，然后充分的去呃弱化主体，而突出它这个影子的部分。所以说这两个词儿
呃呃，这是一个相当于二十章是一个思维的过程，一开始从 portrait 开始，慢慢慢慢变成 shadow， 所以说我把这两个词呃硬生硬生生的结合在一起变成 shadow portrait， 它可能不代表任何意义。对，大概呃就是这一批作品的这个初衷吧。OK， 然后这而且这个。您说，您说，呃、哦，不好意思，宝宝，您说，您说。系列里面还有一个特点，因为呃，以前你的作品呃有一些非常大的尺寸，还会有一些小的，但是在画这个二十张作品里面，基本上定的都是一个尺寸，对吗？对的，是的，是的。呃呃，我是在二从二零一八年开始吧，我是尝试着呃大大小小不同的尺寸。呃，同时画一个图像，那不是一个东西，是一张图像，就是呃，经常会有那个，呃，比如说四五张、呃，都是看着是不太一样的，呃，那个作品，但是是针对于同一个图像的。到了去年二零一九年的时候，一个朋友的建议下，在一个朋友的建议下，他说：“为什么你不尝试同一个尺寸呢？”一开始我是我是觉得这个这个同一个尺寸应该会比较无聊。但是当我做了以后，我发现这个其实这个尺寸对我影响并不是很大，就是我做了这个二十张以后，给我最大的感觉是，呃，有两个感触，一个是让我想起了当时荒木经惟在一个呃视频访谈里边<咳>说过，他说当他拍摄的时候，他希望身上周边有五六台照相机供他使用，他可以呃换着相机的去拍同一个东西。他觉得这样是取得了最大的满足感，然后他举了一个例子，是那种像东方有那种千手观音，就是你看一个身子，但是很多手臂，然后他的感觉是这样。然后我做这批系列到最后的时候，我就感觉我我是非常接近于他这种感受，就是好像五六台相机同时拍一个东西一样，因为我以前也有摄影的那个经历。然后还有一个呢，就是我感觉这个就是因为每张画我尽量把这个呃。呃，就是方法固定在一种方法上，比如尺寸固定在一个尺寸上，然后我把这些就是能让我产生新鲜感的元素都放的非常的低，就变成一种单一的。然后我想把最大的这种呃变化展示在这个画面上，所以说它出现了每每张都不太一样。然后，嗯，一开始开开始起稿的时候其实都差不多，每张都差不多。但是画着画着变，就即使就算我想重复之前的那个，最后我发现也会发生非常大的变化，就是有一点点的不确定因素就会发生，导致非常大的变化。我想这就是绘画最有意思的地方，就是它的不确定性和它的不可预测性。嗯，说在我画之前，我都是一张一张画的，就是一张隔一张像接龙一样。所以说，在我画之前，我不知道这二十张会会是这个样子，我以为会很无聊，但其实它是很丰富的一个整体。然后那个，嗯，对，会有，因为我知道原来你不是在六月份会有一个个展，呃，嗯、我不知道那个个展里面是不是原来打算把二十张一起全部都展出？对，嗯，这个对你来讲是很重要吗？这个二十张在一起，我们观众才能感觉到你的从 portrait 到 shadow 的过程，因为如果我们就是看。对对对一个就变成有一点是碎片的啊，嗯，所以说这次在台北呢，呃，我展出的作品也是按照顺序来的，从一到六，啊，嗯，一到六，嗯，那对你来讲，因为你已经画了二十张，这个是不是等于是这个这个系列就是结束了？呃，你下一步工作你觉得会有比较大的变化吗？或者是你你有没有什么感觉？他他他怎么会？会发生。呃，是这样。当我画到第十二章的时候，我就想结束了。然后我我到画到第十二章的时候，我依然没有说是呃非常厌恶这个东西。然后所以说到第十三章的时候，我就画了一个比这个尺寸还要大的。我想作为一个结束第十三章，但是第十三结束完了以后，我又继续画了十四、十五、十六，也是这个小尺寸的，不过是。就是这东西，我觉得是这样。就是当我零一一七年的时候画完第一章的时候，我觉得 OK 了。但是两年以后，我又重新开始了。所以说，不知道以后会不会再重新开始，这都是未知。但是我呃，肯定的是，我现在还没有特别厌烦。
所以说，我觉得这就是绘画的魅力，就是它可以不停的往下走，不停的继续。就像就像以前，就像大大师说的，说是这这张画它你可以无限制往下画，无限制去去做，你只有是这是达芬奇说的吧，应该是。<笑>就是你可以无限制往下做，没有结束的时候，你只有遗弃的时候，但没有结束的时候。嗯，对，那就我们非常期待。所以我就觉得，嗯，好的。这里，我、呃、不知道，如果我们还有时间，我我还有一句话可以问，因为。这里面的就是你现在画的这种风格，其实跟你以前画的一些，呃，我们理解有一点像是风景，呃，这些作品，我我主要就是想问，因为嗯，你说这个是也是可以技术，也是可以减速，这里面你你怎么会区别于你其他的一些作品，它算不算这个系列里面就就有一个界限嘛？是不是那种 shadow portrait 的一个？方式方法，或者接近他的感觉感受，或者你其他的是有有从故事性，或者是从内容，或者是从绘画的方式会有区别吗？呃，我觉得还是这个以时间为主吧。比如说这个时间段，你思考的问题是大概这样，这个是这个主题和内容，它只是一个介质，就是它对我来说，我觉得是不是说非常重要的元素？啊，就是它是可能是。呃，我所想的，大脑所想的，但是到画面上，当你当你真正画的时候，呃，是是另外一回事就是你需要你的身体去参与，并且跟你的大脑的思维进行呃斗争，呃和谐，然后在画面中展示出来的是你的大脑的你的思维和你的身体的一个结合，就是你的消化的过程，而不简单是你只是思维。嗯 ，OK， 嗯，那你们现在就是你，你可以去去吗？在北京，你被解放了吗？现在？其实我们这个社区还可以，呃，比较通融，通情达理。就是在最严重的时候，我还可以出去买茶叶，没有问题。啊、<笑>好，那很非常期待什么时候在 Maximo de Carlo 会有有你的这个 Shadow Portrait 全系列展出给我们看。呃，我一定要去看。好，非常感谢，谢谢，谢谢，非常感谢，谢谢，谢谢啊，好 ，Thank you, Thank you, Karen, Thank you, the song, Thank you, Robin. Okay. All right, Thank you all for joining us. That's fantastic. I, I really love how we're able to do these kind of cross-border conversations. I actually find it's a really exciting way to kind of look at work together because otherwise, I think for you know. Four of us plus some friends to get together in one studio it would be impossible. <laughs> uh, so thanks very much, Claudia, for organizing that. Uh, make sure to check out Li Song's paintings on Massimo De Carlo's page on uh, Taipei Connections. Uh, last but certainly not least, today uh, we are turning to London, uh, where Chris Craig, the director of uh, Bastion Gallery, is going to be speaking about uh, Anson Kiefer's work. I'm uh, very excited about this one. There's a really nice uh, Kiefer work on Bastian's page in Taipei Connections. Um, I'm going to help Chris do a little bit of translation, uh, not line for line, but uh, every few minutes I'll kind of uh, summarize what he's speaking about. Uh, so Chris, over to you. And I think you have a screen share for us as well. I do indeed. Yes, morning, everybody. Uh, morning from London, that is. Good afternoon uh, in Asia. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I hope that you're all keeping safe and well. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to join you this morning. In fact, the last time I was really speaking to anyone face to face about art was also uh, in Taipei, uh, because that was the last event that we were pretty much able to travel to before we were put into lockdown. So uh, it's nice to be able to speak to you all again. Uh, before I start talking about Anton Kiefer, I just want to introduce the gallery a little bit to people who maybe are not familiar with us. Uh, Bastion was founded in 1989 by Celine and Heine Bastion. Uh, they came to the gallery life from the perspective of collectors and of curators and uh, the artists that they worked with are artists who they've had personal relationships with throughout their lives, including people such as Cy Twombly, um, whose catalogue resume we also wrote, uh, Robert Rauschenberg and Andy Warhol. Uh, I'm very pleased as well to be able to speak about another artist today who the gallery have had a very long uh, personal relationship with, and that is Anselm Kiefer, uh, to 
briefly introduce Kiefer. He is one of the three great post-Second World War German artists alongside Gerhard Richter and George Basilus. Um, all three of them actually studied together under Joseph Boys um, in Dusseldorf. Um, Boys is another figure who actually the Vaseline Gallery have a very close relationship with. Um, Heiner actually was the personal private secretary of Joseph Boys for a number of years up to him of his life. And, um, and through that connection, we kind of met Amazon Kiefer. So the uh, Boys, his, his role here is very important. He was the first German artist who really started to engage with the political narrative of Germany post-war and, and, and post-fascism and Nazism. And when you speak about Kiefer, a lot, a lot of the time, if you're familiar with his work, you must automatically are drawn to the histories that he speaks about. Um, he was born in 1945, two months before the end of the Second World War. Uh, and so he kind of carried that history with him. His father was a soldier in the German army and served during the Second World War. Uh, and his early work focused quite heavily on Nazism and fascism. Um, he, he has also been exceptionally well exhibited. Uh, in 1980, alongside George Basilist, he represented Germany at, at the Verde Biennale. Uh, and subsequently has had institutional shows at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Royal Academy in London, the Institute of Chicago and Foundation Baylor in, in Basel, as well as numerous other exhibitions, which are too long to note here. Uh, a couple of personal comments actually on him as well, which are, are really worth noting is, the first is that he considers himself a bit of a dinosaur. He still makes all of his own paintings himself. Uh, he doesn't accept studio assistance uh, and he, he works in a very, physical and aggressive manner using a palette knife. Uh, the other thing is that he has an incredibly sharp sense of humor. Uh, and I think that's incredibly important in the subject that we're talking about here, pathos. He is somebody who is not afraid to engage with his subject matter uh, face on. He doesn't shy away from it. He isn't scared by it. Uh, and whilst not all of it is funny, he is able to find an emotional connection with it. Uh, and I'm really pleased actually that the subject of pathos has, has been brought up today because it actually made me rethink Kiefer's work slightly. Um, most people focus on history and memory when they talk about Kiefer's work. Uh, the late art critic Robert Hughes once described Kiefer's work as centering on two questions. Um, the first being, what can I remember? And the second one being, what should I remember? Um, Kiefer's, uh, sorry, the pathos here though, is all about emotion. It's about that connection that you have with work. Uh, and so I wanted to really think about how emotion works in Kiefer's oeuvre. Um, I'm just gonna swap over to screen share. Okay, let me just interject there uh, really quickly. Uh,然后很多人看他的作品想到的主要就是历史与记忆这两个问题。我们现在开始看到他的一些报告了，呃，就是说，Kiefer的工作方式是有一些呃呃旧式的，呃，就是说，呃，他可能都是自己呃画面都是自己画出来的，然后是一种呃比较男性的，或者说比较呃嗯，
I never, I turned back to the idea of pathos and I think about where the idea first originates from it is from Aristotle and his ideas on rhetoric, uh, on the idea of conversation, of argument and of convincing people. It forms part of a triptych of terms, including ethos, which is trust or ethics, as you might understand it, and, and logos or logic, reason. Um, and it affects people by being able to convince you to what you're talking about, uh, importance about its truth, about its substance. Uh, and and Kifa comes in this period of time at the end of the Second World War when what you are, uh, what you're confronting if you're a German is a, a dark past, a, a history of uh, of real violence and something which is something which is uh, still shameful to the nation but also not openly spoken about. Uh, in 1969 he produces a body of work called Occupations where he wears his father's uh, army uniform and goes and stands in front of monuments and landscapes around the world giving a Nazi salute. Uh, it was a work that labelled him as a neo-fascist at the time and that put off a number of critics from his work, but he was defended because his work was ultimately trying to re-engage the German nation with their history. Um, and the Germans actually have a fantastic word for this, which is Vergangenheitsbewältigung, um, <laughs> which is all one word, which basically means the struggle to come to terms with the negative past. Uh, and I, I love this term because it's kind of, it, it sums up this, this, this notion really of, uh, of history, of its of its kind of impermanence and also of the emotional baggage that it has. Uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, so one of the works which we have in our display at Taipei is this very early watercolor called Nok Nish, um, which translates to not yet in English. I'm not certain exactly what the Mandarin translation would be, but, uh, here, Kiefer is viewing the kind of utopian German landscape. He is engaging with an idea of national nationality and of sovereignty, which is exclusively without people, uh, without history in a social context, but uh, a history purely of the kind of physical world around him. Uh, it also conjures up ideas of the sort of romantic sublime, um, his pre previous German artists, such as um, Karl uh, and, uh, and and other German expressionist artists from before the war. Um, Kiefer found it very it was almost impossible to sort of disassociate Germany and its landscape from traumas of the recent past. And I think this is something which really plays into Kiefer's strength: this idea of taking the subject matter and letting it do the work for you. Um, when we talk about this kind of triptych of pathos, logos, and ethos, if you already assume that people <clears throat> know the subject, know the traumas of the past, and then take that as your subject matter and then use it, then you can engage people immediately. You don't have to do a lot of the work of getting the artist or getting the viewer as an artist to come around to your way of seeing. Um, so the Second World War features incredibly prominently in his body of work, but also other things do as well. He has, he, uh, has taken the works of, of Wagner, the operatic works of Wagner, as his source material in a series of works uh, from the Meissen Singer to Parsifal. Uh, he uses this imagery because it is another artwork from another German national which was being kind of corrupted, the Norse mythology of the ring cycle taken and abused by uh, certain Aryan types within, within fascism to, to imbue it with a different sense of, of, of history. And so when you view this work, and sort of, it already affects the viewer in a certain way. And so taking this material, he's able to move the conversation forward. And then the idea of pathos, therefore, becomes not a question purely of, of a historical narrative, but of the way in which it is presented. And for Kiefer, it's very, very literal. Um, it, the paintings that he produces about the Holocaust often put in items of clothing. They physically depict the camps themselves. They have 
uh, names and numbers and tags and clothes inserted into their construction. Uh, if I take you back to a photo of him in front of his paintings, he, he works on a very large scale. He doesn't always work on a large scale, but when he does, he has this huge palette knife, which you can see in his hand, which looks kind of like a machete, which he uses to apply the paint very thickly. And then when he comes back to his canvases, he, he lets them set and then he will attack them, hack at them and remove the paint. So you have an idea of fluidity in his work whereby he will apply the paint, he will let it drip, let it hang, let it have its own life and then remove it. So it's a constant flux. It's an idea that he repeats a lot in his own writing on his work and when he's interviewed, this idea that his paintings are never finished. That in all our previous conversations, we had the, the concept of the painting is, is concluded when the, when the paint feels like it is set, when it is when it's most free and creative. Um, for Kiefer, the idea to let the work be the studio doesn't indicate the end, but purely the next step in its evolution. Let me jump in there. Uh, Sorry, jump in. 所以他刚才提了一点特别有趣，就是说 Kiefer 有讲过，呃，历史是不存在的，就只有我们对历史的理解。<coughs> 啊，或者是就个人的记忆，因为集体的记忆，啊，然后他提到这一点，就是说，呃 ，Kiefer 用所用的这些题材，呃，是让他省掉很多的力气啊，就是他选择了这种已经呃特别有重量，大家印象特别清楚的呃题材的话，他就不需要在作品去讲这些故事，故事大家已经在。大家的心里，在我们的记忆里啊，所以他的作品就是用情感去在这些记忆之上啊，去做一些呃、啊、其他的呃更进一步的工作。Go ahead. Thank you.、Uh, yeah. So having kind of given life to these canvases, what he is is effectively doing is asking the viewer to reconsider their position on these events. Uh, whether I mean not to view them necessarily favorably, but to position themselves within historical narrative of the perspective of of where they are as a viewer, of where they will be as a viewer in a few decades' times. I mean, the works that Kiefer was producing in the sixties and seventies, which got him labeled a neo-Nazi, are now、uh, works which last year he received、um, an honorary award from the National Museum. Uh, well, the National Jewish Museum in, in in Germany for his for his long lifelong support of Jewish causes,、uh, and it's interesting how to say that shift of fifty years of someone's career can change how your perspective of it. And the same is true of these of these narratives.、Uh, and so, when he when Kiefer is when Kiefer is taking、um, taking these ideas, he is working purely on things which shock him, things that he knows are going to get. A reaction. So whether it be things like the Holocaust, whether it be、uh, Wagner, whether it be the poetry of、uh, the Roman, Romanian Jewish、uh, poet Paul Celan, or whether it be Christological and、uh, Judaical imagery such as the story of Christ, which he which he repeat、uh, visited in two thousand and six in this large installation, which is in、uh, Tate Modern here in London. Called Palm Sunday, where he again locks into a story which everyone is familiar with, the story of Christ, and he takes it for himself and he replays it repeatedly. And the story becomes an evolution because another work which we brought with us to Taipei for Taipei Connections is this work from two thousand two called Untitled DNA. Now, this. Is an early work that kind of preempts the Palm Sunday series, whereby you have a clearly a palm tree motif here, executed again with a palette knife, very roughly, very rawly. But then he takes it and retitles it DNA. So now you have this confluence of science and of religion.、Uh, and for for Kiefer, knowledge is is key. That he is always learning. He is always reading. His recent show here in London was discussing theories of string theory. Uh, I just a string theory, I'd say,、uh, and for him, spirituality and science coexist. And so, when you have a work like this, which kind of takes something which is a beginning story, an origin story, in many regards, and then tie it in with DNA, you see 
uh, say a concept which is immediately multifarious. It's no longer just a single idea. It is multiple ideas and it's conveyed very, very simply and very effectively. And that's what is Kiefer's great strength is that he lets the subject matter do a lot of talk, talking for him. And then when you as a viewer receive it, you're amazed by the simplicity, but also by the sheer level of emotions that you can have in front of it. Um, and that brings me on to one of the last things I want to say um, this morning, uh, which is that for Kiefer, the material is so important. Materials have always been important to artists, whether it be the kind of use of gold leaf or lapis lazuli in early Renaissance paintings, uh, or you know the use of the internet in post-internet art currently. You, what you have in Kiefer is an idea of alchemy, the idea that a simple material, a base material, can be turned into something fantastic. He, he uses straw and he uses lead a lot in his work, and he uses both of these materials because they have the capacity to change. Um, straw can be burnt and turned to ash, and he uses the ash in his paintings as well. Um, straw can be decomposed and turned into fertilizer. Lead has always had alchemic qualities from its early ideas that it could be converted into gold to the idea of pipe works and its practical usage uh, in the Victorian period through to its current concerns as a poison. So these materials in themselves have an immediate emotional content which he can use to his advantage. And it also allows him to continue this idea of constant evolution. So his work is, is never complete. I say the, the painting services can be quite fragile if you think that you have straw and ash uh, assembled on these, on these canvases sometimes elements of them fall off and he is very open to encouraging that idea because the work is still constantly in flux the work is always evolving and he leaves his paintings and canvases outside for years at a time he can start on a painting leave it outside to the elements bring it back into his studio in 12 months time and rework it uh, and so with that kind of in mind what is interesting is how detached Kiefer therefore becomes from his work uh, how how he is very open to chance. Um, it recalls the, the Great Glass by Marcel Duchamp as well, which um, he left in his studio to gather dust before sticking the dust to it in its final form. Uh, and what you finally have is this separation of artist and artwork. And one of the things that Kiefer is very, very keen to stress is in regards to history and to regards to his own work, that there needs to be a clear separation between what the artist does and who the artist is. I say the artist does not need to be a moral person. They do not need to be a good person. They need to be able to produce work which reflects the time in which they live. Um, and then, and so on the subject of pathos, I think that's a nice place to conclude whereby you have the, the logic, the history, the narrative as you see it, merged with emotion, merged with all of the subjective material that we are fed. And then at the end of it, what you have is a document and the document is produced by the artist, by Kiefer is as uh, liable to be corrupted as anything else, but it is in existence and it is a record of, of what is produced. That's really fascinating. Uh, thank you. That's a really, really interesting place, I think, for this whole panel. To conclude, uh, uh, Kiefer, uh, 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 这也是代表时间历史的过去的一种节奏和力度。最后克斯提里点是说艺术家和他的作品是要分开看的。
啊，然后他这个现实有可能是有负面的，有可能是道德的，但是这个和艺术家的身份啊是没有直接关系的。嗯 ，So thank you very much.、Uh, that was really enlightening.、Uh, thank you to all of our panelists today.、Uh, it was a real pleasure to have all of these、uh, four artists in dialogue. I'm really happy that's something that we can do、uh, with this Taipei Connections platform. I look forward to seeing everybody online again、uh, tomorrow. We're going to be doing a studio visit with、uh, Wu Jitong tomorrow night,、uh, 8 p.m. Taipei time, I believe. So we might even be able to get some Americans online if they're up early.、Um, that should be a, a really interesting visit. So I hope to see everyone back again then. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. Thank you, Robert.